Hello, everyone, and welcome to Elevate Your Business. I'm Ed Jarecki, and I'm thrilled to guide you through today's episode, designed to inspire and empower you on your journey to business success. Thank you for joining us on making this part of your entrepreneurial journey. Elevate Your Business is crafted for business owners, professionals, and budding entrepreneurs eager to gain practical wisdom and insights. During each episode, we tap into the experience of those who have navigated the path of success in their business and lives, aiming to equip you with the tools you need to thrive. Today's guest illustrates this mission. So make yourself comfortable, unwind, and let's extend a hearty greeting to our incredible guest today, Paul Riedel Jr. Paul is the CEO of River Run, a technology services company offering a variety of managed and a la carte IT services to meet their clients' needs. They start every new relationship with a thorough assessment of their network and customize the services to meet client-specific business goals. Their mission, provide you with incredible technology experiences. Their vision, be always better. Why? Their team is committed to helping its people, their clients, and the community achieve meaningful results. As Paul joins us on the show, he'll shed light on what success means to him personally and how his definition has evolved over time, as well as one or two of his top challenges and the lessons learned associated with them. And finally for today, we'll explore how Paul has leveraged innovation in his business and other work to overcome challenges and achieve his goals. So join me in welcoming Paul Riedel as we embark on another incredible episode of Elevate Your Business. Without further ado... Welcome to the show, Paul. It's great to see you again. How are you doing? Thanks, Ed. It's great to see you as well. I'm doing great. And hello, everybody out there in podcast land. Uh, looking forward to sharing what knowledge I do have. Well, it was wonderful getting to know you a little bit, a little bit about your business, and especially the philosophy in which you have led and grown your business. So to start with, could you share a little bit more about yourself and your business? So Ed did a wonderful job at laying out the organization. And as we pull back the covers here, our company, we're a managed services provider. So we are the outsourced IT department for over 300 different companies. And those companies primarily in the state of Wisconsin, but they do extend outside of that throughout the United States and into different parts of the world as well. So our focus is working with that small mid-sized business and small defined as organizations with 25 people up to 500 people. And as we work with those organizations, the focus that we have is one, understanding their business and then understanding how this tool called IT helps them achieve their business goals. And if we don't understand their business or don't understand their goals, we're not being as effective as we should be with regards to the IT part. So, so the IT part, our job is to make sure that, as I said, we're understanding their business, we're helping bring solutions to them that help them drive their business, move everything forward in that regards. And so we provide not only the hardware and the software to run their business, but also we provide the technical expertise to implement and then to manage and then maintain the system. So we're doing strategic planning for clients. We're doing the day-to-day -day maintenance for clients. We're doing the day-to-day -day help desk for clients. And then we're helping make sure that the clients are staying on track with their technology plan. And again, making sure that the technology and the services that we provide are meeting the goals and the directives that they have within their organization. So I hope that helps. Absolutely. And we've had a couple of spinoffs to our conversation relative to some of what's going on out there. Are there one or two things you can talk about in this evolution of IT innovation in serving businesses and customers out there? What kind of is going on right now with uh, the MSP side of the world? Yeah, what the MSP side of the world and is something that I'm sure everybody's getting a little tired of hearing about, but that is that S word and that security or the C word, the cybersecurity. And so as we look at this, cybersecurity has to be something that is talked about, not just in the, the server room or in T meetings. We have to be talking about security in the C-suite. The, the owners of the organization. The owners that are the organization don't have to understand it completely, but they have to understand the concepts and where do we need to protect ourselves. So, and if I'm going too far, Ed, pull me back. But the main things that I want to make sure we're getting out there and that people are thinking about is you think about securing your network, securing your data, the same way you think about securing your home. In that years ago, we used to be able to, you know, drive into the driveway, throw the keys on the floor of the car so you wouldn't leave them and walk into the unlocked house. Well, that, that was my life. Well, now my life is, uh-uh, I've got the security system. I've got the garage where the car is secured. I've got the house has multiple locks. And so the thing that we have to look at is we have to understand the concept, not maybe understand how the lock works, 
but we have to know this is the lock we need to have in place. Not understanding how the window locks work, but making sure that the windows are locked. And so the big thing is that the C-suite, we have to understand strategically how and where are we securing ourselves and what data needs to be secured. The other thing that we have to talk about and plan for is how do we recover from some type of event? And it doesn't matter whether we're storing our data internally or we're storing it on that one little notebook that I carry around or we're storing it up in the cloud. We have to have a plan for how do we recover in the event that, bam, we have a security event. Because I'm going to use the old cliche, it's not if it happens, it, when it happens. There will be security events that everybody does have some experience with. Yeah. And so again, it's how do you lock your system up and how do you secure yourself? Because we as consumers and we as users of this great technology are getting complacent. And so the C-suite has to make sure we're not complacent. We have to have open dialogue with the IT people to make sure there's good communication going on. And then we have to have these tactical steps with how do we keep ourselves safe and how do we educate our people? But there has to be that working. And a lot of times, unfortunately, we'll see businesses where the IT team and the, the C-suite are bumping heads. It's not that they don't want to work together. It's that they're saying two different things. C-suite is saying, hey, keep an eye on this budget. IT people are saying, boy, they never give me any money. But there's just not an explanation as far as, hey, how does my investment go? How is my investment going to be used to keep me safe? And what's the return on that investment? And that's where we struggle in that regards. So the security piece, and sorry I'm so long-winded on this. This is one of the things, Ed, that I'm extremely passionate about, getting us aware, getting us secure, making sure that we're thinking and talking about that security piece, because it's horrendous if you have to go through some type of a security event. The other piece that's going on that we're talking about right now quite a bit is that wonderful world of AI and how does artificial intelligence come into play and where should it be and how do I utilize it? And and a lot of people don't realize that we've been using AI for years and years and years and years. And artificial intelligence is built into a lot of the tools that we use to keep ourselves safe. It's built into some of the CRM tools and some of the other tools that we're utilizing there. So the question is, what are the repetitive type issues or repetitive tasks that we're taking that could AI help substitute or fix those? Now, the one thing that we talk with our clients about is not using AI as a crutch, but using AI as a springboard. And so what do I mean by that? If you think about AI like ChatGPT and you say, hey, guess what? I'm going to use this ChatGPT and it's going to write a cybersecurity article for me. And I just have it kick that out. And I say, done. Bam. Now I've checked it off my list. I've got a cybersecurity article written. But am I learning what's going on in that? Am I taking that and using that to spring forward and say, ah, there's some interesting information here. Well, is it accurate? Number one, but is it also something that we should expand on a certain area? And we should, we should blow that up to, to have more details so that people can really understand that particular concept. So what I see a lot, all too often is that people will use it as that crutch where they'll just say, oh, I got to get something done and they'll just cr quickly create it. But they're not processing and using it to say, how can I get more advanced with the concept? And if you think about it, the chat GPT or the, the Google or the searches, it's not different from what I had to go through. And I know Ed's younger than I am, but you know, you had to go through in that as I <laughs> as I went, I had to go to the old library, get my my parents to drive me to the library, and then I had to go through the card catalog and write a number down and then of the Dewey Decimal System. And then I had to go to the shelves and find this book if it was there. And then I'd have to go back to the librarian and say, the book's not there. Where is the book? Oh, it's coming back in a week. So you'd have to wait for this. Well, there's a lot of steps. But then we got this cool thing, these search engine, these Google things. Now we could get data. But if we just started copying and pasting to do our reports, we're not really learning. But if we processed it and said, oh, this is interesting and linking to something else and something else. And we got, instead of this much knowledge, we got tenfold the amount of knowledge. Well, now we're using it as a tool it leaps us forward as opposed to a crutch that just gets us the same performance. I hope I'm making sense. I don't want to be too long-winded here. You're good. I do want to step back to the security for our audience out there. When you're thinking about cybersecurity, it is one of those challenges that every business must deal with that has a fundamental cost associated with it and not always a tangible benefit. 
But if anybody out there is thinking that they haven't dealt with some type of cyber cyber crime issue, if you've been on any list where Facebook, where your financial institution, where the credit reporting agencies, every one of those have had major issues and the number of incidents in which ransomware is being employed or other type of cyber crimes, it goes on all the time. And most of us out there, whether directly or indirectly, have been part of the cybercrime experience. It's not easy. And here's the other challenge. So the second point with that is, is also consider that those cyber criminals out there, and for those of us that have been monitoring this over the years and the decades, they went from not being able to clearly communicate so you could easily identify those fraudsters out there trying to get at your bank accounts because their messaging were off, their graphics were off. It was really obvious issues in the approaches they were using. And as time has evolved, it's actually come to a point where you can really, unless you know specifically what to look for, you can't tell a fraudster's, you know, bank, hey, contact us because your account's been compromised and click here versus what a bank may produce. And so it's really something that's going to continue to evolve. And all AI is doing, so kind of bridging it back to that is it's not only enabling businesses to be more competitive, be more connected, to be more efficient and cost effective, but it's also enabling those cyber criminals out there to come after you know, the passwords. Recently, I was in a conversation and I believe the, um, the number is around 25 characters for a password to really have some level, real level of resistance against some of these AI cyber criminal tools out there to be able to compromise them. 25 characters. And oh, by the way, those cannot be easy phrases or anything like that because they'll catch those in a heartbeat. So if you think that this is going to go away anytime soon, even once quantum compute is out there, it's still going to be an issue because it comes down to your ability to protect your password, to protect your information in a manner that's going to really create the barriers for these cyber criminals to come after you. But they're going to continue to try to find a way. Again, right on at every point that you just made there, Ed. That's definitely right. And so some of the daunting things based off of what you just talked about, a 25-character password, there's no way I can remember that. So what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? So so that's one of the things as far as password managers are excellent tools, and that's something that I'd encourage people to look into for a password manager to protect all of the passwords that they have. Um, the other thing would be to go through on their phones and on their systems and eliminate old applications because we're always, oh, look at this cool application. You download it and then you use it for a couple of weeks and then you forget about it. Well, if that's not being maintained and updated, that can become a hole for us um, with regards to the bad actors could use to compromise our systems. So some of those are the pieces that we should be looking at inside of our businesses. We definitely want to have strong processes with how we do certain things, mainly the financial pieces. In other words, a process where I will take an email from somebody saying, oh yeah, change my account information. That's got to be, a, we can't do that. Our processes do not allow that. And the other thing is if you have a very dynamic business and you're doing acquisitions or you're hiring a lot of people and you're growing quickly, it's really have an onboarding where it brings the people in and says, here's what we will do that we'll take with emails or with text. Here's what we will not do. And, and in a lot of cases, it just comes down to, I'm not going to email or text you to go get me some gift cards and give me the numbers off of them because I'm in a meeting. It's a situation that we have to make sure that we're going old school and we're confirming with voice calls to people with definite communication. Now, the voice calls, again, let's be overprotective and let's not be less trusting. So when an email is sent to me that says, oh, just call this number and confirm the site, that's not what you do. You say, hey, I'm going to look up the bank's number and grab it from an area that I know it's a legit number and call the bank or call the financial group and t talk that way as opposed to using a link or a provided phone number in an email. We all get busy. We have to make sure that we are not spending the time doing double duty and multitasking. We can't multitask when it comes to keeping ourselves secure and our data secure. We have to make sure that we're spending our time focused on 
what am I working on? That's If it's computer or financial related, or you got to respond to something, make sure that you're focused on that and not distracted with four other things. And to boil that down in a podcast episode that I recorded last week, conversation was, we traditionally have been trust and verify, but as this world becomes more complex and as the it, the probability of being a victim of cybercrime, it really goes to verify than trust. Yep. Verify. I'll even throw one before that. I'll say be suspicious, then verify, then <laughs> trust, unfortunately. <laughs> I know that's pessimistic, but it's, it's <laughs> kept us out of a lot of problems there. And one other thing, too, to think about is the social media that you use, just as casual. Ed, Ed mentioned Facebook. And that's something, it's fascinating. I, I um, have a, a friend of mine and I, I saw her at her business and I walked in and she said, hey, she looked at me, she goes, Paul, I got a, I got a problem. And she hung her head and I said, oh, what's going on? And she goes, you were right. And I'm never right in her eyes. So this was a surprise to me. I'm like, I was right. Oh, tell me what I was right about. And she said, I got hacked. And I'm like, oh no. I said, what is the business? Or what, what's happening? And she said, no, I got my, my Facebook account hacked. And they changed my name. They changed my background. I'm now the CEO of a company. But the good news is I had a vacation in Barbados. So that seemed pretty cool. And I was like, oh. And so she's like, why are they doing this? And I said, they're doing this because they want to see, well, do you have anything connected to your Facebook account? Do you have bank accounts? Do you have anything connected to that? And then the other part to that is gathering and mining your data that they can get to compromise another site that you have. And then also they utilize it for Again, selling your information, selling your data to others that are still out there mining. So no matter if it just seems like it's just Facebook, it's just some of my information. My this advice to you there is look at the security settings on all of your social media and make sure that it's set to what you really want it and need it to be set to. Because long story short, she thought she had her, her system set to only have people that she was friends with by accessing it, but actually it was more wide open than that. And so the other thing too is activating that multi-factor authentication on anything that you have is another big thing to put out there. So I know I'm securing the tar out of everybody here, and that's not what they came just to listen to, but it's one of those things that we really need to take seriously. And I can talk about this all day long. So if anybody has questions <laughs> or anything, please don't hesitate to follow up because I, I just, the faster we can put the bad actors out of business by shoring everything up, the better. Absolutely. So a couple of key takeaways for our audience. Number one, change your passwords relatively frequently, even on your social media accounts. Number two, make sure that you've got two-factor authentication turned on. And yes, I am one that is getting incredibly weary of having to go through two-factor authentication. And I'm imploring the companies that are creating those solutions to come up with something else. Because the last thing that as a business owner I know I want to do, and I come from the technology world, the last thing in the world I want to do is spend half my time trying to maintain all, all of this stuff, in, including go through two-factor authentication 50 times a day. But it's so incredibly important to change your passwords, create complex passwords, use two-factor authentication to protect yourself, your data, and your future. Yep. All right. And so lastly, I've... lastly, have a go solid ahead. backup. Sorry about that. Lastly, have a solid backup of any of the critical data so that you can recover just in case there is an event. All right, right, back to you, Ed. Yeah, we could have done an entire show just on cybercrime, et cetera. All right, so first question, success. How do you define that today? Right now, I define success in a few different areas. The first way that I define success is, are my people growing and are my people developing? Are my people being challenged? And that's a big, important part to me. I was actually, I was having a conversation about this with a, a good friend of mine on Saturday, and we were just talking about how we evaluate success within our business and what are we proud of and what are we pumped about? And it's when I see somebody that started answering the phones at River Run and they're now running our sales team 17 years later, I just say, that's pretty cool. You know, that's fun. It's fun to see people growing and developing their skills. The The other part to that is that I look at success is, is are they able to, to do the things that they want to do in their lives? I take it very seriously that we've got 77 people and I've got to make sure those 77 people can go home and support their families and support their lives and do the things that they need to do and want to do to be able to have meaningful results in their lives. 
that's important to us as well. And I'm very happy to say that I'll see the new cars coming into the parking lot and I'll hear about the college education that they're being able to pay for, the new houses. And those are the material things. But the other cool part about it is, yeah, I get to go to my kid's soccer game. I get to go to my kid's baseball games. And so so the other part to that is that balance that the people get to that work-life balance that, you know, there's a lot of work to, that can be done here. And could you work 24-7? You sure could. But it's not yes. what we want to do. We want to work as efficiently as well as we can, take great care of our clients. But also, let's make sure we're keeping the reality of this and that we've got to spend the time with our people. And we've got to make sure that there our people are spending the time with their families and enjoying the life that they should be enjoying and, and getting the meaningful results, both personal and professionally. Well, I so, love the fact, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, I love the fact that you focus on developing people because quite honest, what I'm seeing out there, reading about experience myself is the focus on developing existing employees has really dropped dramatically. Large companies, small companies, mid-size really doesn't matter. And that's a shame because the world is changing. Things are evolving. People need to be able to upskill and they need the support and time to do it. Now, an additional insight for our audience, don't wait if your organization isn't helping you. And even if they are, go out and self-learn. Take classes through LinkedIn Learning, take classes through Coursera or several other different organizations out there, many of them that offer. Look at podcasts. So bottom line is continue to educate yourself, skill up where you can, because that is unfortunately becoming a lesser benefit a lot of organizations. So Paul, I applaud you and River Run and continuing to be able to support that in your employees. Thanks, Ed. Uh, you know, it's funny because I see that as well about the developing the people is not there. And I think a lot of it has to do with the kind of that relationship between the team member and the organization. The team member is like, I'm going to fly as fast as I can. I'm going to go somewhere else as quick as I can. You're going to train me and then I'm out of here. And I think if we keep in mind that, how do we create a win-win-win situation? Good for the clients, good for our people, and good for River Run in our case is, how do we do that? And how do we make it so that it's good for me to train people and it's good for me to teach them new skills? And if I'm giving them a good environment where they're able to achieve the things in their lives that they want to, then it's a win-win. So what we also do tied to the development is we do what we call an IDP for our people, Individual Development Plan. And that's designed to, let's bring it out. Let's not talk about your ability to install servers or your ability to move somebody to the cloud. Let's talk about what's driving you and what's the next step. What other development do we need for you? Do you want to get better at presenting tough, complex situations to the C-suite? You want to get better at handling tough conversations with clients. What is it that you want to get better at? And so then we put the skills in and we put the training in, or we give them the time to do those types of activities. But it's got to be a team effort. It can't just be the company says, hey, we'll send you this training for handling difficult conversations or being a great leader. It's got to be that people all have the skin in the game and they're doing things together. And that's what we find is very beneficial. We also find that those IDP meetings, those sessions, and we do those two times a year, officially where they're updating their individual development plan, but they're they're talking about it monthly as far as, okay, how are you doing? Are you moving towards your plan? Yep, I'm doing the things I need to do. I'm reading this or I'm taking this course or whatever it is. But then we find like in the IDP plans that things come out. So in other words, we had somebody who he just, she said, boy, I'm, I'm thinking of retiring. Okay. Well, what are you thinking about? Well, two to three years. Okay. Well, she's got a lot of things going on in her life and the current political situation is really affecting her. And so I was like, yeah, this is causing a bit of stress for her. So we had a good IDP session talking about life and just said, you know, you've said two to three years in retiring. What's, you know, excuse me, holding that in and tell us what's mm -hmm. the reality of when you're thinking of retiring. We don't want you to go, but we realize you may but we'd like to have the deadline so we can plan with you. And so she thought about it for a week and came back and she said, I'll be retiring in end of July. And I said, end of July. Wow. Well, she's my accounting, my, my accounting person, not the head of accounting, but she's one of the staff accountants and she does a wonderful job for us. And I said, Oh my gosh, that's sad that you're leaving. She's given us a couple months to get ready and prepped. Well, we wouldn't have had that if we didn't have those conversations with our people who's talking about, What's your dreams? What are you going for? And because we spend the time doing that and we know 
not just the technical goals, but personal goals, what kind of makes them tick personally, it just helps. Now, do we have that on all 77 people? No, we don't. But are we working on it? Yes, we are. We keep working to get it as much as we can from all the people and make sure that we're helping achieve meaningful results for the company and for them. And so that's the big thing. You know, from our first conversation, I love the culture that you instill. I'm going to move us to the next question. How has your definition of success evolved over time? There were times when the definition of success was that, yes, I'd be able to take home a few shekels and pay my bills at home. You know, that was, <laughs> that was the definition of success. We we could go pay some bills. Yeah, it was it was funny because we always have had the commitments that the banks, the personal guarantees for things and all of this. And I was very proud after a few years, I was able to go home to my wife and say, honey, I was able to take the house off of the commitments. And so now that's it's clear. And she looked at me and she said, wait. We could have been homeless. <laughs> it's like, yes, we talked about that. Those are the documents that you signed. I explained that to you. We, well, I didn't. Well, and oh, so the point of the story is, my wife's a wonderfully intelligent woman. She's a school teacher. Did that for thirty three years. That wasn't her focus, though. My job is to make sure she's aware of everything. And the other thing, and I know I'm kind of going off topic, but the other thing was, um, you know, part of that that success is making sure that my family life and my home life does not, didn't fail, didn't become a mess when my business life was great or vice versa. And so my definition of success there is, again, making sure my wife knows what's the good, what's the bad, what's the ugly that's going on in the business and my kids as well. So that was one of the things one of my mentors said is just make sure your family knows what's going on. And it was great because at dinner, we would talk about, hey, how's this going on in business? And and it's helped my daughters who are now out of the house. It helped them with their careers because they would reference back, hey, dad, remember when we talked about such and such, you know, that, that salesperson that wasn't doing his job and you worked with them? And I say, yeah, she goes, yeah, I've got some people around me that aren't doing that. I'm looking at these situations. So it's, it was nice. We had, I had my own little board of directors at home who would ask questions. And as they grew, they, <laughs> their skills grew as well. So that was a that was another part of it. Having happy, successful people in my family, that was a big part for me as well. The other thing, definition of success was that we would take amazing care of clients and making sure that we had long-term clients and making sure that the clients were saying, wow, River Run, yep, they're doing great for us. And having very strong relationships with them so that if there was a time when there something wasn't working well, that they would say, hey, things aren't right. We'd have good communication. We'd get it taken care of for them. So those are some of the main pieces about the definition of success that I had. We had the financial definitions of we would grow every year a certain amount. And there were times when we would get stuck. And so our definition of success is we'd grow to 3 million and yes, we're going to get there. And then we'd hit 3 million and we just couldn't get past it. Well, what's going on? Well, we'd have to understand what does it take to be a $6 million company? We had to make changes in order to get past that $3 million ceiling. And so we found that every $3 million, there was a bit of a ceiling and we kind of bumped our heads on. And so we'd have to figure out how do we get through that ceiling in order to be able to grow and get to the next level so that we could have a situation where we're not going to keep hitting a ceiling. We'll just continuously grow throughout the history of the organization. And I'd love to say, boy, every year we had a year over year, two digit increase every time. But we as I said, hit those bumps but the definition of success we had there was continue to grow and figure out, again, is it training? Is it people? What do we need to do to continue to grow there? So long-winded answer. You've already alluded to some of this, but what are one or two key challenges and the lessons learned through that journey? There's, there's two big things. One is that old adage about, are the people that got you here going to get you there? And that's one of those things that as a leader, it's the most heart-wrenching thing when you come to the conclusion that oh, this person can't get me to the next level. What am I going to do? And that's the heart-wrenching thing that I go through. And so at times what we have to do is we have to just really evaluate and say, well, is this a good experience for that person? Is it a good experience for the clients? And is it a good experience for River Run by having that person in that role? And if the answer is no on any one of them, you have to kind of be real and start saying, okay, what do we need to do? And they be trained up. And if the decision is, nope, they can't, well then let's help them to give them an opportunity for a very heads held high exit strategy 
that creates that win-win. Good for them, good for the organization as they're exiting the situation or the business. And it unfortunately, it has to happen. And the hardest part is taking the emotion out of it. People believe they're doing the best they can. They believe they're, they're going to grow and they're going to be fantastic. And at times, it's not there. And what I've noticed is that we have to find people that have a thirst for knowledge and they have a drive to educate. And just like you were saying before, Ed, that you know, hit some of the, uh, the sites to gain knowledge about certain things. If you're curious about security, let's just find out about it. If you're curious about how to grow your business, find out more about it, talk to more people, hit in the round tables and things like that. So as we come back, and again, I know I'm streaming a little bit here, as we come back and get, get into the next stages of how do you continue to develop those people, that's a big part. And then the the stress of, yeah, I got to make a decision. That's a hard thing to do. So you want to make sure that you're being realistic with yourself. And if you're not sure, it's get outside counsel to talk to and just say, hey, here's what I'm seeing with this person. It happens to me regularly. There's times when I get the paralysis and I'm like, oh, no, 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 I got to be doing something wrong. It's got to be me. And then I say, well, wait a minute. No, <laughs> I'm clear on what my expectations are and they're not being met. Are my expectations wrong? They might need to be modified, but I'm open to that. But I'm also open to saying, clients are telling me this has to happen. We can't change those expectations there. The other thing that's a powerful tool that I use, and that's some questions. And there's three of them that I ask myself, and I have to do it on a regular basis. And that is, does it need to be said? Does it need to be said by me? And does it need to be said now? What we forget as leaders is the amount of clout that we have when we ask a question or we make a comment. And we have to be very careful of the does it need to be said? And should it be from me if this message come from me or should it come from a supervisor? Or should it come from a, a coworker or who should be prov providing that message? And then does it need to be said right this minute? And there's a lot of times when I just have to bite my tongue because the answer is nope, nope, nope. Yeah. Or, yep, it needs to be said, but not by me and not right now. And then I have to go and find and mentor the person who maybe should have said it in that situation or talk about it that way. The third thing in there is that you have to remember that your message at times won't get through. So I only have 77 people in the organization. It's not a, a ton of people, but boy, oh boy, it's sometimes you just look and go, wow. I've said it seven times, mm -hmm. I've said it eight times, and in an all-company meeting, and people just don't hear it. So one of the things that you want to do is, I call it the Columbo. I just walk around. It's an old detective show from years ago, for those of you who are going <laughs> the Columbo. I remember but, it. <laughs> but All right, good. Thank you. Um, so there's two of us. But So the point being that he would casually interrogate people, just, oh, by the way, and then he'd ask a question. And so I do that a lot. I just wander around, and I'm like, oh, by the way. I heard about this or like today I walked by and somebody was looking at his screen and I said, oh, by the way, I said, tell me what you're looking at here. By the way, how does this work? Why is that number red and that number is green? What's going on with that? And he was like explaining it and telling me. And so I gather, yeah, gather information. And that information kind of helps me formulate how are we doing and do I need to ask somebody else a question and get them to work on it. So again, it gets back to making sure that I'm asking good questions, making sure that I'm wandering around and just asking people how things are going. And it's also, if there's important points that you want to make sure, it's just asking people and saying, oh, what did you think of that meeting? Or what did you think of this topic? And how, how, would, you, how would you utilize that tool? You can tell if people, if they give you the glassy eye and go, oh, I really don't know. Well, then you have an opportunity to just say, oh, let me show you where that is. And let me show you how this works. Because now it's really going to sink in because the next time you see them and ask the question, they're going to be like, oh, here it is. And this is how it works. Fantastic. So it's not trying to undercut the people that are reporting to you, but it is, again, good to do the spot checks as you wander around. Absolutely. Matter of fact, there's two thoughts that come to mind. And first is timing and approach is everything. And that approach could include it can't can be communicated by me but it needs to be communicated by somebody else. And then who is that right person? And yep. sometimes, by the way, that's not even internal. Sometimes those messages have to come from an external entity. And I've leveraged that approach a few times to really drive home those messages because at times, you know, well, you expect them to say that. Look at their rank, look at their role or whatever it is. Right. So you bring in those other people with those ideas, those thoughts, those reinforcements, 
and leverage them to help drive home those messages in a much deeper, more personal way. Your business is all about innovation. And we talked earlier in the show about the fact that this continues to evolve. Cybercrime continues to go up, but there are also some amazing tools out there with blockchain. Artificial intelligence is a wonderful tool and necessary to combat the AI that's being used against organizations. So today, how would you describe innovation relative to how it's driving and growing your business? Well, oh, innovation. I'm sighing because it's such a necessary part of the business. It's such a distraction. It's such an exciting piece. It's such disappointment. It's such frustration. It's it's just all of the above. So so the way that we look at innovation inside of Riverrun is we look at it in a few different levels. Number one is we look at the 1% improvement factor. We don't have to invent the Apple Watch. We don't have to invent some, some big, huge new technology. It may be just that we have to do something a little differently, adjust a process, adjust a procedure, adjust how we interact with a client, adjust how we load their, their systems. It's how we monitor their systems. It's just that 1% change. Because if we can make a 1% improvement every day, and that compounds over 356 days, it's a 3,778% improvement if we do that over a year period of time. So but we want to make sure that innovation is something that people are thinking about every day, but not necessarily, hey, we've got this 500-hour project that we have to take on and make happen. So now when we start looking at the, how do we keep clients protected? How do we keep system going or systems safe? A lot of times we have to start looking for innovative ways to leverage our business partners. So River Run with 77 people in the organization, I can't staff a full stacked security operations center that can compete with some of the big players out there. So what we do is we're innovative by saying, okay, let's look for a security operations center that has the tools, but doesn't have tools that are just the same tools that they've developed as well, but uses outside tools and uses best of breed tools, but they have the best of breed services inside of their security operations center. So we partner with a security operations center that has tools that then goes in as River Run and the client sees it as here's River Run service offering. And the service we use, it's called Barracuda and Barracuda MSP, big billion dollar company. They've got resources like crazy. They can continue to be innovative and we can continue to provide them right. feedback and provide them the systems. But we use their resources to be able to bring the best of breed tools and the best of breed processes to the clients. And so that's part of our innovative aspect as well. We also look for our internal team to say, hey, what can we take on that we've got to test or we've got to do? Because in innovation, when you're innovative, especially with what we do, is if we're innovative and we come up with this new product and we say, oh my gosh, all of our clients need it. Well, now we have to introduce that product to 300 clients. We have to tell them, hey, we're putting a new system on, or we're doing this new thing for you and it's great and it's, here's what it'll do. And so you, in essence, have to spend the time educating and getting the clients to move to this new tool. And we have to spend the time incorporating it. We have to spend the time training all the teams. So there's a lot of pieces, parts of innovation that kind of helps us go, whoa, let's hold off doing that. But then we go back to the first question as far as, is this the right solution for our clients? And a lot of times the answer is, no, it's not. What we've got over here is, but they were selling this and it was pretty cool and pretty shiny and definitely necessary. <laughs> yeah. So we have a very tight process for how do we introduce new, new innovative ideas to the organization because of the fact that it's very expensive for River Run. It's very expensive for our clients. And a lot of times if we do it, it's not nearly as effective as a billion dollar security operations center team that they're able to provide that much better service. But we constantly are working with them and being innovative with them by giving them data, by giving them testing, by giving them feedback and working with them to say, hey, how do we tweak? How do we update? Is this product still the right thing? Because if they make a change, then we have to make a change, but it's a shared innovation. So my advice there is to make sure that you're just not innovating for the sake of innovating. And because it's a cool, shiny thing, it's making sure that you're leveraging the relationships that you have to get as much value or much bang for the buck as you can. With Barracuda and with River Run, as I said, the clients see us as it's River Run's security solution, but 
we're constantly giving feedback, tweaking, and working with Barracuda to get make sure that it's the right solution and that's constantly updated and working. So I hope I'm making sense in that. Absolutely. Matter of fact, I'll reinforce one point relative to the strategic partnerships, whether that's Barracuda or whoever else an organization is using. Those become so important because they're the ones focused on whatever they're doing. They're road mapping into the future. Every one of those good companies out there, and they, as I spent a lot of time in the technology world over the last several decades, uh, that's where I would get a tremendous amount of I'd have my primary, my secondary, and sometimes my tertiary strategic partnership within a specific area of technology. And that allowed me to always stay on the forefront of what's going on, where are they going? And it also gave a voice because as a strategic partner, you're part of their chain of inputs and their testers on the outputs relative to the advancements they're making in their particular area of focus and expertise. So right. incredibly important and more important every day for small, mid-sized businesses and all businesses of all sizes to have the right strategic partnerships, but to treat them as partners, as part of your internal community, essentially, in order to create those win-win-win successes. Yep. That yeah, that partner part piece is fantastic. And I'm really glad you mentioned that, Ed, because it really does shed the light on a partner versus a vendor versus somebody who sells me stuff. And as you look at those three levels, the partnering piece, I find it's overused so much. And it's unfortunately, it's worked its way into the sales category of sales where it's, oh, we want to partner with you. It's like, well, no, you're just trying to sell me something. In our world, we want to make sure that if we are having some type of an agreement with an organization, be it with one of our clients or with one of our vendors, it's let's make sure they're aware of what's going on. Where's our company going? What are they seeing from the outside looking in? How easy it is for them to do business with us? Because they may say, boy, this is really tough in this area. Oh, help us understand that. And we can do some learning there and help each other be more efficient. And that's true partnering. That's true collaboration. And so that's what we're looking for when we're working with a client is that partner word keeps getting abused. So we work at that collaboration. We're collaborating for the definition of success between the two organizations. What does it mean? How do we make it better? And we love having conversations with our clients, but also with our vendors about that specifically. So that's really good points, Ed. Thank you. Final takeaways for our audience. What is that one thing that you would either reemphasize from what we've talked about or provide new as something that all business owners should consider as part of their journey to their success? The main thing, and I'm going to be a broken record, is making sure that cybersecurity discussion, cybersecurity strategy is in the C-suite and that you all are talking about it on a minimally um, a monthly basis. Just making sure that the doors are locked and the windows are locked and that the alarm's set and that, that you're testing the system that way. That's a big piece to the uh, there. The other piece to that is trust your gut. And you don't realize how much you're learning as you're running a business. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of times you're getting a basically the full-fledged college education in a short period of time, but you're paying is the college education for it a lot of times. And so it is trusting what you're learning and also making sure that you are getting out of your business and joining different roundtables or definitely in, in listening to the podcasts. But the roundtables are great because if they're run correctly, they can act as a sounding board for you and they can also act as they holding up the mirror for you so that the mirror says, look at what's really going on, Paul. And, and a lot of times those conversations, though they're humbling, are also very good for you. And that just helps reemphasize that, yeah, your gut was right. Yep. You just aren't listening and you're not pushing what your gut is telling you you need to do. So those are the two big things that I've got. Outstanding. I want to thank you. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. And a special thank you to our guest, Paul Riedel, for sharing his insights, experiences, and success tactics with us. We hope this conversation has left you inspired and motivated to embrace the challenges of entrepreneurship with vigor, innovation, and adaptability. Remember, success comes in many forms, and it's essential to define it for yourself. Take the lessons shared by Paul to heart as you navigate your own entrepreneurial journey. Embrace change. Seek out opportunities for growth and always be willing to adapt to the ever-evolving landscape of business. Thank you once again to our phenomenal guest speaker, Paul Riedel, and thank you all for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you next time as we continue exploring the stories of 
behind incredible entrepreneurs. Stay resilient and stay innovative, everyone. Have a wonderful day.